So I got a call from my wife a week and a half, two weeks ago, and she says, hey, after work, can you stop by church and meet with Nathan and Roger and Philip? And I said, sure, I got no problem with that. So I did. And I walk in, I stand out and you kind of look through the glass and then someone sees the shadow, so they wave you in. And so then they said, uh, uh, they said Nathan is uh, going on a camp out with the youth and young adults on, that, on this Sunday. And then uh, Philip is going on his walkabout, driveabout to the great northwest this Sunday. And Roger wants to go do some family stuff this Sunday. So we need you to preach. So I'm just saying that if you get a call from Megan to come meet the principal, the vice principal, and the, I don't know, just say, tell, tell them you got like a bad connection, or I can't hear you now, and, and turn your phone off or something. So for a second here, we're going to pretend that Philip is not here. Philip has a dear, dear friend that he's taking care of right now, and when he gets that situation taken care of, he will depart. He was, going to be, he was going to be leaving on Friday, but he's still here. He's going to depart. So what I was going to do real quick to make sure that they understood that we weren't playing hooky today, I was going to take a picture of everybody waving, and, and then I could text it to Roger and Philip and Nathan to where they knew that we were actually here doing something. So if you can, if we're going to pretend Philip is there, so he'll like duck. As I, as I just, any, everyone okay if I take a quick picture? Just snap, snap, snap. You got to wave, though. You got to wave, though. You got to wave. Hands up, wave, wave. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to send that to him, and when I do, I'm going to tell Roger and Philip and Nathan, I'm going to say, when next time they're gone, I asked who wanted to deliver the message, and everyone raised their hand. So, so, yeah. Is that wrong? Hey, I gotta make. I gotta get it to where they don't do the, have me do this anymore. So, I, what are we gonna talk about today? Talk about discipline. You guys see that? Okay, okay. Discipline. A couple things when we think about discipline. One of the things that we think about is punishment. Uh, punishment. I think about that a lot because my dad was what I call a disciplinarian. I have an older brother and a younger brother, and we all needed a little bit of discipline every now and then, once or twice a day. And, uh, and my dad was really good at it. He was really good at it. But he was fair and just at it, too. Another type of discipline we talk about, self-control. That's also another, another definition, basically, of discipline. Some of you guys that know me better, any, any idea which one we're going to go with today? Yeah, we're going we're to go self-control. We're going to go self-control. I'll wait till my dad's here one of these days to talk about the punishment. He, he'll, he'll talk about the other one. We're going to talk about self-control. So we've got the 12 disciplines came from this book that was a gift. Disciplines of a Godly Young Man. This was a gift by, to my kids, to my boys, three boys, I got three boys, by Ben Davison, who's here, and his wife, Sandy. He gave this book to my boys because he loved them. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben, for a uh, imparting love and, and uh, caring about my children and my family. I appreciate that. We're going to focus on 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, the second part. And it says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. That's the amplified version. NIV says, train yourself to be godly. Any King Jamers in the house? Yeah, I had, to, I had to put it in here for you, Max. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So that's going to be our focus, to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. And yeah, we got 12 of them in here. 
And I know all the old pastors said, oh, do three. Always do groups of three. And I know that. I understand that. But Jesus had how many disciples? He didn't have three. That's right. He had 12. So we're going to do 12 disciplines. We're going to start with the discipline of purity. It's the freedom from adulteration, contamination, or sexual immorality. Giving in to sexual temptation is easily probably the biggest obstacle to godliness among men today. And I thought I'd just pause real quick and ask if there's a man in here that thinks that that's not a true statement. I guess you can raise your hand, but I don't think we're going to see any hands come up. But that's really not a new situation. Because there was a guy a long time ago. We know him as King David. Okay? In the, in the, in the Old, Old Testament account in 2 Samuel, we know, a couple, we know several things about King David. We know that King David, he loved God. It says he was, a, he was a man after God's own heart. And I won't mention the, the, the biblical, the Bible references in there, just to, but they're in there. And if you, want a, if you want a copy of it later, Megan can get you a copy. But he was a man after God's own heart. We know from, biblical, from the Bible he was a talented athlete. He was a fine musician. He was a masterful poet. Have you ever heard Psalm 23? He wrote that. That's pretty good. That beats Robert Frost stuff any day. He killed Goliath. David was a decorated military general. Highly respected man. He was considered, is considered, the greatest king of Israel. He was on what we would say he was on top of the world. He had it all. And enters Bathsheba, if you put the A up there. So here comes Bathsheba, and everything changes. The results of the encounter with David and Bathsheba, adultery. Lying goes on, murder, death, family degeneration, a national decline. The Bible says, a displeased Lord. This was my topic. This is the second time I've done this. The first time, it was very similar. You saw a slide, a slide very similar to this. And I just, it just, in my heart, do we see any similarities from then to where we're at right now in this country? Very similar situation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, For this is the will of God. We always ask, what is God's will? Here, go here. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, the God who gives us the Holy Spirit. That needs to be down. So that's supposed to be encompassing the word holiness. And this is the problem when you do, thing on, do something on one PC and then you do something else on another PC with no time in there. So that is supposed to be around holiness. And we have to ask the question, why would we think we are called to holiness? We're just, we're just people. But we can look back to Leviticus. Because God told Moses, he said, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord God, am holy. As Christians, we must live pure, godly lives. You ask, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? Back with the kids, they always ask these questions. Kids ask great questions. They always ask questions. And we have a chance to either just answer their question, or the best answer is, well, what do you think the Bible says? To where they can start to engage in the Bible, ask a question, because we need to do that as, a, excuse me, as adults. 
If we relied on answering our own questions, we'd be in trouble. We need his answers, his revelation. So we tell the kids, well, let's look in the Bible for the answer. So we look in the Bible. So how can a young person stay on the path of purity? And you know, God knew this was going to be a problem for us. So he wrote Psalm 119.9. And it asks the question, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? And it answers it right then. It says, by living according to your word. By living according to God's word. That's how we stay on the path of purity. Has anyone ever seen this movie, Fireproof? Yeah. If you haven't, you need to. Let me tell you. There's two movies that, 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 are, that, are, that exist that at the end of the movie, I'm tired, I'm yawning, so my eyes water like crazy, and it's, it, it, uh, hey, I don't cry, I'm not emotional, so I don't, it, I'm yawning, okay? It's a yawn. You look away from the wife and the kids and do the old, I'm tired. Well, in that movie, here's what he's getting ready to do. If you see that picture, he's getting ready to, to, to just nail a computer. He took this computer outside, and he's got a baseball bat, and he's getting ready to just wail on that computer. Well, when the computer was in the house, he would get on that and go to some very inappropriate stuff. Uh, it, that computer caused him to sin. Ninth chapter of Mark, verse 47, says, And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. That's what he did with that computer. He tore it out. Not that the computer was causing him to sin, but everything on that computer. It was disrupting his marriage, his life. He was sinning. He took it out, eliminated it. Job. We all know the account of Job. Job was was a a blameless. The Bible says he was blameless and upright. Uh, He feared God and shunned evil. And he says, I made a covenant with my own eyes not to look at a young woman lustfully. Have we made that covenant? Ephesians 5.3 says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Powerful statements. So to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of purity. The discipline of friendship. Friendship being the emotions or conduct of friends, a state of mutual trust and support. Let's look at the the, the story, the creation story. And the count of Genesis, just to get started here. God said, let there be light. He did that, and he says, it was good. He made the land and the seas. It was good. Vegetation, it was good. Sun, moon, and stars, it was good. Sea creatures and birds, he said it was good. He made animals teaming and walking around the earth. It was good. He made Adam. It was not good. So he went the next step. He made Adam. He made Eve, Adam's helper. And after doing that, after he made Adam's friend, it was very good. I can tell you my wife sits right here. My best friend. It is very good. God gave us to each other for a reason. And it is very good. We need amazing friendships. The Bible gives us an account of an amazing friendship. When we look at David and Jonathan, Jonathan was King Saul's son. And this is amazing. The ESV version says, The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. I mean, can we say that about anybody that we know? Is our soul knit to the soul of someone else? NIV says, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. I mean, is there anybody? 
I mean, I'm, I'm racking my brain. Is there anyone that I am one in spirit? And I love him as myself. I mean, outside of my wife, and sometimes we're not even there. You know? that's, that's amazing. That's an amazing friendship. Proverbs 17, 17. It says, a friend loves at all times. Not just when things are good. Not just when everything's going really well. On top of the world, no. At all times. All times. So to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of friendship. Then there's the discipline of mind. Mind being the element of a person that enables them to think, to feel, and to be aware of the world and their experiences. Does anyone know who that is? Yeah, who, who, Jim? Yeah, Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud, he's an he's a, a Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist. I mean, he is like the guy. Uh, died in 1939. Uh, an atheist. They say, well, they say a lot of things. Here's what he came up with. The three tiers of the mind. The conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious. Conscious being communicates to the outside world and inner self. Subconscious retains recent memories, connects unconscious to the conscious. And the unconscious tier is the storehouse for all the memories and the past experiences of which our beliefs and our habits and our behaviors are formed. They say that, that some of Freud's... Uh, his theories are kind of disputed now because we're smarter people and everything. But he did, he was correct in that the things that we think about they do have an impact on who we are. But just so happens there was a guy named Paul. However, he was an apostle of Christ. He was not a neurologist. He explained this long before Sigmund came, came about. What did he say? Oh, if we look at Philippians 4.8. He said, finally, brothers and sisters. He says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So there's a list of the things we're supposed to think about. And if I say, think about something that's lovely... Our brains just automatically think about something that's lovely. It's amazing how God created that. It's written in there to think about those, not the opposites. It didn't write, think about what's false. It didn't say, think about, don't think about what's false. Because as soon as we say the opposite, we start thinking the opposite. A second ago, we said, think about what's lovely. And we all probably thought of something that was lovely. Our spouse, a little puppy dog, whatever, a teddy bear, whatever. But if I say, think of something that's horrible, we all think of something that's horrible. And that image of our spouse or a puppy dog or something that's lovely, it, it goes away. So we are not to think about things that are false or dishonorable or wrong or impure, or horrible, deplorable or poor, or unworthy. We're supposed to focus on the good. Don't focus on the bad. There's a Psalm, one, Psalm 139 that says, God fearfully and wonderfully made our minds. They are amazing instruments. So do we understand the, I said, do we understand the, the, fo- the impact of, our focus has on our spirit, the things we think about. Do we really understand all that? This picture of a TV and internet use. I mean, what are we pumping into our homes? Psalm 101, verses 2 and 3 says, I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. There's some vile stuff going through the lines through those TVs and and computers. 
Now, I'm not going to sing it. Roger stands, he stood up here one day and he sang this song. I'm not going to sing it. But we've got to remember, I don't sing in public without getting highly paid. But we've got to remember, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Ah, what are we pumping into our ears? Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Pop that little crib up there as a reminder, because I'm, I'm still new at this, and I like, don't want to get sidetracked and everything, so I still need these little uh, PowerPoints. And that crib represents what we did with our kids when they were little. What we tried to pump into their in through their ears and into their mind and into their spirits and souls. And so we had this little CD and a little CD player, and we would put that thing on loop. And it would just dump praise and worship music into their bedroom while they were sleeping. It was probably on 24-7. I don't even know if we ever unplugged it. We had some different ones. So if they were, if they were sick and under the weather, it was a different set of CDs that would, that would, that would promote healing into my children's little spirits. Otherwise, it was just normal old praise and worship. And so you can ask, Terry can ask me, you think that made a difference in the, kid, in my life, the life of my kids? Absolutely it did. Absolutely it did. They couldn't talk. They couldn't do anything. All they could eat, drink, and sleep, and other things that Megan needed to take care of. And, but they were getting God's Word in their little tiny spirits. And the verse of that song says, Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. How are the kids spending the days today? As I am, as I'm playing with this thing, man, Psalm 119, 97 says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. We got kids playing Xbox all day long. PlayStation all day long. Nintendo all day long. Need to be meditating on God's Word. We struggle to do it five minutes a day. It needs to be all day long. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Quality time. Everybody in here have quality time? Quality time? What's our quality time look like? Does it look like that? Dad's controlling the TV with the remote. Mom's on the laptop. Who knows? Playing, working. I don't know. Is that our quality time these days? Or does it look like that? Husband, wife, man, woman, friends, Bible open, in the Word. We need to turn pages, guys, gals, not channels. We cannot be profoundly influenced by that which we do not know. And we cannot be transformed without being informed. And that Bible is how we get there. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To discipline ourselves to purpose, for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of mind. Discipline of devotion. Devotion being love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause, or a religious worship or observance. As Christians, we, we got to spend time with God. It's not, a, it's not even an option. We have to spend time with God. We go to James 4.8. He says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. And that's a true statement. 
daily devotions. I was going to make a guarantee, a personal guarantee. This daily devotion plan, Philip came on board, he has this daily devotion plan. Every day you read a, you read a chapter of the Old Testament or a chapter of the Bible, and for the overachievers, there's a column in there. You can read another chapter out of a, one of the Gospels. And on the back, it has an explanation of how you journal. My guarantee is that for some of you, this plan will work to bring you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the other guarantee. There's two parts. For some of you, this plan will not work. And that's okay. So long as you have another plan, you have to have some way to connect with God. This isn't going to work for everybody for a lot of different reasons. And that's fine. But we have to find what works. We have to find what works. There's five aspects. Well, I'm going to go through five aspects. You can probably read something else, and there's going to be another group of five. So here's five aspects of a daily devotion that we need to take a look at. First, we need to start with prayer. Pray. Jesus taught us how to do that. We just say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Just pray. Second thing we need to do, is meditate. Psalm says, Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his way, on his law, he meditates day and night. We got to meditate on that. We got to absorb that in. It's not just sitting down and reading the Bible. Man, it's reading. It's taking it in. It is absorbing that like a sponge. We need to confess our sins because He is faithful and just to forgive them. But we've got to confess them first. We worship Him. Number four, we worship Him. We did that earlier. It's amazing, you know. For, sing to the Lord, declare His glory, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is great. He's done great things. And he is worthy of praise and honor. We love to get it if it's at work or whatever or playing a sport. We love to get it. God does too. And he probably he deserves it a whole lot more than we do. And then there's the old number five. Ugh. Submit. Not my will, but yours, God. We've got to do that. So to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of devotion. It needs to be part of what we do. Discipline of prayer. That's a solemn request for help or expression of thanks addressed to God or an object of worship. I tried to keep the, I just pulled them off the internet, whatever I could find, or an object of worship. I wanted to cut that off, but... We got to be very. We got to make sure that we understand that there's a lot of people out there that think a little differently. But we lift it up to God because He is the one true living God. As Christians, we, we have to pray. Again, not an option. Not an option. We got to do it. Have to do it. Ephesians six twelve. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul goes on, he describes the armor of God, which of the armor of God, my favorite one, the coolest one, I think, that shield of faith. And man, I love that shield of faith. It allows me to knock down the flaming arrows that the devil shoots at me. I love that thing. I love it. So after he talks about the, the armor of God, then Paul tells us how to pray in, in the 18th verse. 
and, and pray how? He says, pray in the Spirit. And pray when? He says, on all occasions. And we ask and pray for what? And he says, all kinds of prayers and requests. So we can lift up to God anything and everything at any time. Aligned with God's Holy Spirit. There's power. There's power there. James 5.16 The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's a true statement too. You probably hear me say that a lot of times. I'll read a piece of scripture and I'll say, that's a true statement. Well, duh. Everything in there is. That's the God we serve. But the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you need prayer, then go find a righteous man. If you want your prayers to be as powerful as possible, go get righteous. To discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of prayer. Yeah, that last one. You guys saw that slide come up. Yeah, I know. I, I thought, man, how about we just go with 11? 11 disciplines. Discipline of tongue. Tongue, it's this fleshy, muscular organ in the mouth of a mammal used for tasting, licking, swallowing, and in humans, articulating speech. I would skip this, guys, but we probably need this one really bad, too. One of the biggest lies ever. Anyone want to take a guess what I say is one of the biggest lies ever? Oh... Yeah, yeah, she didn't even see it. She didn't even know what was going on here. Sticks and stones. Everybody knows that, right? How's it go? Yeah, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's, a, that's one of the biggest lies ever. The garbage that spews from our mouth, it cuts to the core. And when I say core, I mean that's, that's our spirit inside. Man, I'd rather get beaten like that computer with a baseball bat than to have someone just lash out on me. That baseball bat, those, 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 it'll heal up. It might take some time. But when your soul gets cut wide open with words... It is a long, painful process to get that healed up. But can I just say, we need to make that process. We need to make that journey because we need to get to the point where we can be forgiven and we can forgive those people if we want to, if we want to be forgiven. But words hurt. So God gives us some instruction he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. He says, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Psalm 34, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. You know, what's usually attached to the tongue? Not, not physically. You know what's usually attached to the tongue, in my opinion? A critical spirit. Mm. We did a, we've, we've covered, we've covered some of these spiritual gifts, right? So in Romans, we, we bring in the spiritual gifts of Exhortation, giving, leadership, mercy, prophecy, service, and teaching. In uh, 1 Corinthians, there's the spiritual gifts of uh, administration, apostle, discernment, faith. It's bigger over here. I'll read this way. Uh, helps, knowledge, miracles, prophecy, teaching, tongues, interpretation, wisdom. Ephesians 4 talks about the apostle, the evangelist, 
being a pastor, talks about prophecy again, talks about teaching. And then there's some miscellaneous packages, uh, passages which bring in uh, celibacy and martyrdom, hospitality, uh, which one am I leaving? being a missionary, and voluntary poverty. And I looked through that list, and I looked through it again, and I looked through the next, and uh, I'm telling you, critical spirit is not on that list. It is not a spiritual gift. It's not. It's a sin. It's something that we have to work at with the Lord's strength to get rid of, to rise above. It's not a spiritual gift. So we talked about what the tongue shouldn't do and how much it hurts. So we say, what should the tongue do? What should it do? It should be sharing the gospel message. The tongue should be praising, it should be worshiping, it should be teaching, encouraging, and building up each other. The tongue should spend its, all its time proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what the tongue should be doing. But be careful, little mouth, what you say. So to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of tongue. Discipline will work. Activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result and often done as a means of earning income. A lot of us do that. Love work. <laughs> yeah, well, let me tell you something. As Christians, we need to be the best workers. Need to be. The Lord God, when he, when he did all this creating stuff going on, had it all going on, he put Adam, he, he created Adam, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? In Genesis 2.15, it says to work it and to take care of it. Might I say it was probably a lot easier to work in that garden before all the weeds and everything came in. But then it became toil when sin entered. But he was there to work it. We know that God was a worker. Just looking at the account of, of creation, Genesis 2, he says, By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Bradbury team rule number seven. You guys laugh. We have a signed agreement with our children, Cooper Gentry, Easton, and Mesa, all four of them. It has Bradbury team rules. If you want to be part of the Bradbury team, you sign up. And, and they had, had they, we were all physically signed our autographs, our signatures on this piece of paper. And that paper, that paper is, uh, it hangs from our fridge. And uh, Bradbury team rule number seven happens to be 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Not to put anyone to the test. Anybody know what that says? Yeah. He who does not work shall not eat. <laughs> and see, y'all laugh. But if my boys were in here right now, they wouldn't be laughing. Because he who does not work shall not eat. And we've done some Saturday mornings where no one showed up out there in the garden or out there in the grass or in the pasture or anything else to do anything because they were tired and sleeping or whatever. And when lunchtime came around, they got to watch me eat. It doesn't happen very often anymore. That thing, well, that's why... That's why I, my heels are, are fatter and, and wider and not quite as tall as yours. But yeah, he who does not work shall not eat. And I know that there are some in here that don't have a job right now. Well, God's going to change that. We're praying for some people right now. We're praying for people. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though if you're working for the Lord and not for man. But I'll tell you what. 
There's not a day goes by out at my job in my office with the air conditioner and computers, and it's a pretty rough gig, right, Larry? It's, you know, but there's not a day that doesn't go by that I don't have to say, whoa, Harv, <laughs> whatever you do, work it out with all my heart as though I'm working for the Lord, not for man. Sometimes it's a struggle. But to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of work. Discipline of perseverance. Steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. The best chapter for this, the best verse for this, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary. Mm. That I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. So when things get tough, understand and draw upon these scriptures. Because to, to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of perseverance. The discipline of church. And we're getting close. Church being a building used for public Christian worship. That was the definition that was in there. So why are you here today? Why are you here today? Mom and dad made me come. We'll hear that. Sometimes. Maybe your husband or wife made you come. Maybe it's something you've just always done, so you're just doing it again. Car just automatically starts and delivers you to this parking lot on a Sunday. Maybe you like the music, so you come. Well, I don't think that's the case. I believe that you are here today because that was God's plan for you. And I believe that you were obedient to that plan. That's why I think you're here. I also believe that you're here today because there's someone here in this room that needs what you got to give. I think that's why we're here. I was told you, you, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. We agree with that. You know? You don't have to go home to your spouse to be married. But if you don't, it makes for a very unhealthy relationship. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're told, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. These empty seats... They're, they're, you, can, you can look at them as empty seats. But the way I see it is it's a holding place for whoever that person was that God wanted to be here who is being disobedient and not showing up. And I'm not saying, because I know we, we got vacations, we have, we have a lot of things going on and everything. I understand that, so I'm not passing any judgment, don't get me wrong. But there's a reason that there's this many seats in here. And I think if it was up to God, which it kind of is, I think He would prefer that every single seat be held down with a human being in it. That's what I think. So to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness... We need the discipline of church. 
and coming together. Discipline of giving. Ugh, man. Freely transferring the possession of something to someone. That's what giving is. Luke 12 says, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Oh, man. Could have knocked this down to like 10 disciplines. It would have been okay. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. I said before, I'll tell you again, that's a true statement. Malachi 3.8, I love this. Let me, let me, I'm going to read the whole thing. It won't take long. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. That's true, too. I circled the word curse, and I circled the word blessing. I can tell you, I see both curses and blessings in people's lives because of giving. Luke 6.38, give, and it will be given to you. So to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of of giving. The discipline of witness. To give or serve as evidence of or to testify to. As Christians, we're called to witness. So after Jesus was, was resurrected, he, 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 got, he told His disciples, He said, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So the question is, are you a disciple? Because if you are, He is sending you. So what witnessing is not? Because we have to understand what it is and what it is not. So I'll do the not first. What witnessing is not, it is not behaving around others in such a way that it shows our exemplary moral character and conduct. That's not what witnessing is. That's what we're pretty good at. What is it? It is behaving around others in such a way that it shows we love Jesus. That's the first part. The second part, and it is making Jesus the focus of our dealings with those that we are around. That's what witnessing is. To discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, we need the discipline of witness. And the discipline of ministry. And if I'm counting right, I think this is the twelfth one but we're not ready for you yet, Matt. Ministry is the work or vocation of a minister or of religion. I said earlier, you are here today because there is someone in this room who needs what you have to give. I don't know what that is. It might be a prayer. It might be a hug. It might be help with something. It might be a $20 bill. It might be a $100 bill. It might be you just need a friend. It might be you just need encouragement. 
Maybe you need a little healing. I don't know what it is. But I know that when you give it to them, that is ministry. You keep it to yourself, you're not ministering to those people. But when you give it to them, that is real ministry. So to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness... We need the discipline of ministry. We need it. So there are the 12 disciplines. Purity, friendship, mind, devotion, prayer, tongue, work, perseverance, church, giving, witness, and ministry. As Christians, we need to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. Matt, you can come on up with the praise team. So that's the message today. And I tell you, that was a hard message to, to go through. Because I'm thinking, man, I would like to skip this one. And man, I would like to skip this one. Because if I was to stand up here and say that I can go through those 12 and say, I got this under control. Check, 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 check 12 times. I'd be lying to you. It's work. It's hard. And it is a daily battle. It's a daily battle for me. It's a daily battle for my friends, my my kids. It's probably, I'm guessing it might be a daily battle for you. But we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. We will not. We, we just can't fix all this stuff by ourselves. I'll tell you what, we need, we need, our, we need our church body who is, who is full of love and we need Jesus. He gets us through those stuff, through all those times, through this stuff. So we invite you as we're playing some invitation music. If there is something on your heart that you want to pray about, or if you want to be more involved with this community of believers, anything. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and something prompted you this week or this day or this morning to to accept Him, We would welcome that. And we'll stand up right up here and go through Peter's confession of faith. If you need Jesus. We all need Him. And if we draw near to Him, He will draw near to us. It's guaranteed. So as we close with an invitation, if you want to come forward, Do so. We'll have people here to to receive you and pray with you. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just come in the name of Jesus and we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the people that are here, Father, and and, uh, and all your words that, that I tried to say. I hope it was glorifying. I hope you're pleased. And uh, if there's someone in this room that, that needs something with you, Now is the time. Now is the time. Thank you, Jesus.